Let's pray this morning. Turn our hearts to the Lord. God, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you that we could come together, worship together, seek you together, God, that we would spur each other to uh, love you more, to listen to your, uh, to listen to your words, God, to allow our hearts to be transformed. We thank you, God, that you are in control. We thank you, God, that you are a mighty God. We thank you that you are a loving God. Uh, we thank you that you uh, sent your son Jesus for us and that you have taken care of our sin. God, I thank you so much that you have uh, allowed us uh, this weekend to, uh, to seek your will. God, to see if... Uh, God, to see if we might be a good fit here. I thank you so much that uh, this church uh, is here and is a faithful witness to you. I pray that you would uh, open our hearts to your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was in college, uh, I spent the two summers of my junior and senior year at a Boy Scout camp. I was a chaplain at a Boy Scout camp in the beautiful northeast Georgia mountains at the foothills of the Appalachians. Uh, I spent my summer at Camp Rainy Mountain. Cell phones did not work at Camp Rainy Mountain. Uh, it was a number of years ago anyways, but at the top of the mountain, uh, we were out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the only place a cell phone worked was kind of just in front of the flagpole. You could see a couple of staff members usually. They didn't allow campers to have them kind of milling about as they tried to make their phone calls home. Uh, but while you were out there, at night, there were no lights. Nothing. Uh, the, the only lights out in this beautiful, uh, this beautiful uh, campgrounds were campfires and flashlights of campers. Uh, they kept as much natural light as possible, so they, they tried not to have any uh, luminescence out there. And you could look up and see the stars just spread out everywhere. It was a gorgeous sight. I've, I've still not seen it quite as beautiful as up on the top of that mountain. It was a great place to talk to young scouts about God who created everything. They could see in creation that week just who God was. But at the same time, I had to be very careful uh, in my conversations with them. In a setting like that, it can be very easy to confuse the significance of creation. While I wanted them to see creation, I did not want them to worship creation. This often led me to reflect on the question that I have for us this week. And that is, what is it that creation tells us about God? I think many of us would agree that creation tells us about God, but what exactly is it telling us? This morning, I want us to look at Psalm 19. So that's my text for the day. You can open there. And it opens with some observations that creation speaks about God. But then it moves past that. Uh, and we'll get to that. I want us to consider this morning what this passage teaches us about the witness of the world, the created world, the witness of the Word, the Scriptures, and how we should respond to that. So if you turn, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. That's where I'll start. The heavens are telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It is rising from one end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Oh, 
and its circuit to the other end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. Creation tells us that there is a creator. We must not confuse creation for the creator. God created the heavens and the earth, not the heavens and the earth are God. You will talk to many people uh, who are spiritual seekers, and they might phrase it as, uh, there is a mother God, or a mother earth and a father sky. Uh, and to quote Napoleon, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, he said, he once quipped, if I had to choose a religion, the sun as the universal giver of life would be my God. I think Napoleon was wrong. To worship creation, the creation, is folly. The sun does not care who you are or what you do. The sun does not care if you need it to shine on it on you or not. The sun does its job, and it does it very well, but it doesn't care about you. It didn't create you. It didn't give you life. We do worship a creator of this universe who sets the path of the sun and upholds the whole of creation by his will. Psalm 135, verses 6 and 7, say this. Let me turn there briefly. Psalm 135, verses 6 and 7 says this. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and in earth, in the sea and all the deeps. He causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, who make lightning for the rain, who brings forth the wind from his treasuries. You see, creation can tell us that there is a creator. It can tell us that something is involved in our life. It tells us that we should worship the creator, not the creation itself. But what is the message of creation? In 19, Psalm 19, uh, verses 1 through 6, the message of creation is simply this. Creation can tell us about the glory and the power of God. We see this in verse 1. The expanse is declaring the work of his hands. This is a there is a remarkable vastness to the universe. So I just want to cover two quick points about this idea. Creation can tell us about the glory of God. We can tell that the universe is quite large. There are billions of galaxies out there, and each of those galaxies has billions of stars, which are suns. It's crazy. Uh, the nearest galactic neighbor that we have is Andromeda, and it is 2.5 million light years away. It would take 30 billion years for a modern spacecraft to reach that galaxy. That's a really big universe, and that's only the closest thing to us. Uh, there's, they think the furthest galaxies from us are something close to 10 billion light years away. So there's a vastness to the created order. We can tell that by looking up at the stars. When you go out tonight and you look up at the skies, you can tell that there is a vast world before you. There's also an incredibly infinitesimally small universe that God is in control of. The atom was once thought the smallest building block of created order. Uh, the Greek philosophers were able to hypothesize about it, but it was more kind of a philosophical thought. But in the 1800s, uh, scientific uh, advances began to help us see atoms. We could tell that they existed. But there are things even smaller than atoms, which is what we found out. That there are protons and neutrons and electrons that make up atoms. So we have subatomic particles. And there are now even, I'm told, there are now even smaller units that we know about. Quarks and leptons. And if you're like me, you're probably in over your head. As soon as you start talking about quarks, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I know that they're small. I know that they are really, really, really small. Uh, but I know that <laughs> something amazing is that there's so much energy in the atom, that's what, when we uh, blow up at atomic bombs, that is a nuclear reaction. The tiniest atom has so much energy in it, so much power in it, that it can create huge explosions. This is incredible. So we know that the universe is vast, and we know that the universe is small. 
and that there is a God who made all of that, who is in control of all of that, from the biggest to the smallest. My point is simply this, that the universe is vast. The universe is tiny. But the universe is not there by accident. A creator is responsible for it. The third part of uh, creation is that uh, creation speaks to all of humanity. So if its message is God is powerful and glorious, its scope is universal to humanity. Creation is a universal witness uh, to the magnificence of God. Language, culture, or distance are not a problem for creation to speak to. All of humanity sees the earth. We feel it under our feet. We are standing on it right now. All of creation sees the sky in the morning. You saw, we didn't see the sun come up today because it's cloudy, but normally you would see the sun come up. I'm sure it did come up because there's light. Even the sun cuts through the clouds some. Uh, So all of humanity has a shared experience of creation. Fascinatingly, so, uh, oh, if you back up one slide for me, Ben. This, uh, this is the northern lights. This last week, this is fascinating, this last week, uh, the city of Reykjavik, the capital of Iceland, decided they wanted to see the northern lights. So they made a city ordinance that everybody turned off their lights. All the uh, commercial businesses, everybody turned off their lights for the night so that they could see this. Right? It's, it's, this is the horizon down at the bottom, actually. Um, and then they, the northern lights. Creation speaks to humanity. You know, people in Reykjavik realize there is something going on here that I want to be a part of. There is something glorious that I want to be a part of. If you are a believer, uh, this is a quote from uh, Hughes. If you are a believer, God has surrounded you with a hymn book. Wherever you are, day or night, you can look up and see the majesty and power of your God. And you can praise Him. That's the point of the beginning of Psalm 19 here, is that anybody can see creation and can understand that God is there. uh, That He is worthy, that He is majestic and powerful and worthy of praise. Romans 1.20 has a similar message that we all have been revealed the glory of God. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. But there's an abrupt shift here in Psalm 19 from verse 6, where the sun rises and goes from one end to the other, and all of humanity is able to hear, to verse 7. So verse 6 goes, it is rising from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end, and there's nothing hidden from its heart, from its heat. Then verse 7 cuts in immediately. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey, and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant, has, is war, uh, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. What is the significance of this abrupt shift? It's simply this. That while the witness of creation is not limited in its scope, it reaches all of humanity, it is limited in its content. Creation does not tell us the specific character of God. For that, we need to turn to Scripture. God spoke to us, and he gave us his words, and we have them written down before us. The word tells us about the character of God. So the world may tell us about the creation, that there is a creator God, but the, and that he is glorious and powerful, but it is the word that tells us about God's character. We learn in this, um, there are many things that you can say about God. So I keep my comments here limited to our text, and even that I summarize some. Just a few points I want to make. 
First, uh, we learn in, in this set, uh, starting with the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. It's God is personal, right? That God is personal. God can relate to us. He speaks and he listens. And furthermore, he expects us to listen and respond. God's communication is like the lists that are listed in verses 7 and 8. So it says the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the precepts of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord. That is God speaking to us. That is what the psalmist is speaking of. God speaking to us. The result of God speaking to us is also listed there. It restores the soul, making wise the simple, rejoicing the heart, enlightening the eyes. You see, God does not just speak just to speak. He does not say words to us just to say words to us. He speaks to give life. He speaks to encourage our souls. He speaks to make us wise when we are not wise, to enlighten our eyes. God is personal, that is the first thing we learn, and he speaks for our benefit. The second thing we learn is that God instructs us. These words are given in order to lead and direct us. Scripture is one way we are given guidance and direction in our lives. I would say there are others. Today our focus on Scripture. Uh, it's like a road map, right? We need, anytime a, you need a road map in order to go to the place that you have never been before, right? We need to know what the end result looks like, but we need help getting there. This morning, I turned on my GPS to get instructions to get to this church. Now, the funny thing is, I'm actually really bad with directions, and my GPSs hate me, so they are a black hole of directions and try to turn me all kinds of weird directions. But I knew the way, uh, and so I was able to follow the correct set of directions that my GPS was not giving me, and we arrived. <laughs> no problems. My wife laughs at me because I really am so bad with directions that apparently the machines around me want to also be wrong. But here's the thing. When God gives us instructions, they are never wrong. right? He will not turn us to the, down the wrong road. He will not turn us onto the wrong highway. God's word is sure. He gives us good directions. He gives us good directions because he cares about us, because he loves us, because he is personal, and he has, he has a vested interest in us, right? My GPS has no interest in me. <laughs> God loves me deeply and wants me to go the right way with my life. We also learn, so if we learn God is personal and God instructs us, we also learn that God is righteous. Uh, verse 9 in particular I want to focus on. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. It is God who gives us knowledge about right and wrong. Moral decisions, uh, we, we are able to make moral decisions because God is good, right? It's not just that he does good things, but that everything that he does radiates goodness, that everything, every inclination of his heart is goodness. So we can make good choices. We can make right moral choices if we listen to God. Because of this, we also know that God must be a judge. Hence the psalmist claim in verse 9. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. These ideas of both God loves us and God judges cannot be dis taken apart from each other. We know that God is good. He must make judgments about what is good. That means he must judge. That means we must listen to him when he judges. Instead of the fickle, changing demands of the Egyptian and Mesopotamian gods of the time, who were part of the pagan religions that surrounded Israel, God's judgments were given as steady and true words. One commentator says it this way, There are no wishy-washy commandments subject to change at the divine whim. 
but secure and permanent statements of what ought to be. You know, I think this speaks to the heart of a lot of problems for today that uh, so often we think uh, God, God's ideas are changeable. Uh, we can do whatever we want. Uh, I don't mean to set up straw men, but I know for a fact that many people think we can just make whatever moral decisions we want. And I would say that is not, that is not how God has set things up. We, it may be difficult sometimes for us to make right moral decisions, but God is not, God is not confused. God has made himself as clear as he can. The scripture helps us to know what we should do, and it also warns of the consequences. So the psalmist has established both the creation and the scriptures, the world and the word, testify about God and who he is. If, God's, if the world testifies to God's creative power and his gloriousness, the scriptures speak about his character and his love for us. But the psalmist doesn't end there. That would be, you know, that's, that's one step you could do. He, he does what all good preachers do. He finishes his work with a call to respond. He is not just telling us abstract truths that God is mighty and powerful and he cares for us for the fun of it. He is telling us that we do something about it. He gives us a proper response in verses 12 through 14, and it's simply this, to examine our hearts, to confess our sin before God, and to trust in him. So I'll read 19, 12 through 14. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The psalmist gives us a few steps. How do we respond to God's vastness? How do we respond to God's goodness? First, he, we should examine our hearts. The first response the psalmist describes is to examine our hearts. Examining our hearts means that we must ask the Lord to open our eyes to what is in our hearts, to the sin that inhabits our lives and makes our hearts dark. But in doing that, we have to admit, one, we, ha we probably have some sin stuck down there. And two, we have to be willing to change it. If you say, God, examine my heart, he's going to start dredging things up. You're not going to be happy with him. You're not going to be happy with yourself. Um, but God can change us. That's the thing. But if, you're, if you don't want to be changed that's going to be a difficult prayer for you. Uh, because, one, God's going to begin working at you anyways. Once you know that you are supposed to change, He'll begin working at you. But two, it's, it's very difficult uh, to let go of the things that are in our hearts. So, A.W. Tozer writes in The Pursuit of God, The ancient curse will not go out painlessly. The tough old miser within us will not lie down and die in obedience to our command. He must be torn out of our heart like a plant from the soil. He must be extracted in agony and blood like a tooth from the jaw. He must be expelled by, from our soul by violence as Christ expelled the money changers from the temple. In other words, when we say, God, open my eyes to the sin in my heart and change me, it is difficult work. But that's the proper response. That's the first proper response. Confess our sin is the second step. So if we say, God, examine my heart, he's going to reveal things to us. That's when we get to the confession of sin. In verse 12, the psalmist asks, who can discern his errors? He's not talking about God's errors. Who can discern God's errors? No, he's talking about himself. Who can discern their own errors? Who can discern what is wrong with them? The question is self-reflective. How can I find out my own faults? You can't. You, you are so blind to your own faults. He says, God, you have to help me find my own faults. If we ask God to examine our hearts, we should expect to be challenged. 
we may find our hearts full of unexpected junk. Uh, once, one summer, I went on a road trip with my roommate in college. His name is Josh Altman Schofer, a good German name. Uh, and we went to the mechanic to get his oil change. We just went to like a Jiffy Lube or something. And we drive in and, you know, it's supposed to be a 30-minute appointment. Uh, they begin changing the oil, but they also, you know, kick around the car a little bit, kick tires, check under the hood, look for things. 30 minutes later, they come in. The, the attendant was, you know, kind of a, a young guy, and he's not all that bright, but he did his job, and he comes up and, uh, Mr. Altman's Hoffer, he had a hard name to say, so, um, Mr. Altman's Hoffer, your, your radiator coolant is supposed to be this nice blue color, and then he, they showed him, it is black. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> See, when they checked the car, when the mechanic checked the car, they began finding things that were not right about the car. The radiator fluid was, was black. I mean, that's like our hearts being black. I mean, that's perfect. Um, the radiator was supposed to be nice, kind of liquidy blue looking material. Maybe it's green, I forget. Um, but instead of being that nice color, it's a dirty black. It is not right. And it's clear both to the uh, attendant and to us, that's going to be a problem. Uh, that had to be fixed. It had to be uh, flushed. They had to start over and change everything out for that part. So this is the thing. When we go to God and we say, God, I want you to examine my heart, he's going to give us a checkup, like going to the mechanic with your car, like even just getting an oil change that results in something else. So you may think, oh, I've just got a couple little things nagging me and I just need to put those before God. And then he comes back and he says, well, it's more than just your oil that needs to be changed today. You've got to fix that radiator coolant as well. Uh, so I don't know what your radiator coolant might be. And it doesn't always happen. I mean, you don't always have to fix your radiator coolant, right? Hopefully if you get it fixed once and next time you go in, your radiator coolant's still fine. Unless something else is wrong. And there's a deeper problem. God's a mechanic of our hearts, right? He checks up on us. And if he's a good mechanic, he finds the things that are going to be a problem and he reveals them to us. The second part here in this psalm, though, is uh, the psalmist talks about presumptive sins. He says, also keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. The presumptive, presumptive sin uh, that he is speaking of is referenced in Numbers 15, 30 through 31, which is also called the high-handed sin. It is simply this, to assume that you know better than God and to sin anyways. To go before God and say, I am going to sin today. Not just, I'm going to stop sinning. I'm just, I'm going to do it, God, and then you're going to deal with it later. That's a presumptive sin. That is a high-handed, that is an intentional Sin. So the first part, the psalm is saying, help me find the unintentional parts of my, my soul. But the second part, he says, keep me away from the presumptive sins. They are much harder to deal with. There is a much deeper problem when we think that we can sin before God and do it intentionally. God, would you keep me from sinning arrogantly against you is the cry of the psalmist's heart. The person who sins in this way has lost their mooring. And they need not just an oil change, but an engine overhaul. But then the psalmist turns, after dealing with our hearts, after confessing our sin, after asking God, keep me away from having such an arrogant heart that I sin on purpose. After he says all that, he lays out verse 14, which are words that many people are comforted by for good reason. Let the words of my heart and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. When we consider the witness of creation and scripture, our lives should be changed. The words we say to others should honor God. Our inner thoughts should honor God. And the psalmist wants us to line up the words and our actions to line up with the guidance that comes from God's word. Finally, a word of trust is given. God is our rock. 
and our Redeemer. We can rely on Him. He is trustworthy. The psalmist does not just leave us with God is great and He loves us, but also that we can turn to God and He is trustworthy and He is good to change us and to keep us changed and to keep changing us and to keep checking our hearts and to keep becoming more like He wants us to be. He is our rock, a new foundation, not just the old us. He is our Redeemer, the one who changes us. The message of Psalm 19 is simple. Creation testifies to the glory of God. It has a vast scope, universal in its scope, but it has a very small content. We need Scripture as well that testifies to God's character to tell us about who He is and how He wants us to respond to Him. We are meant to respond appropriately. God has asked us to respond appropriately. Daily, we are given an opportunity to turn our eyes to the creative wonders that God has put before us. The world testifies to us. When the sun rose this morning, it testified to you that God is there and He is powerful. How will we respond? Like the psalmist, I pray that we open our hearts to God, confess our sin, and trust in God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Only then will we be able to respond appropriately to the testimony of the world and the word. Thank you. Uh, I think we pray and then we'll have a final hymn. Is that right? So I'll pray for us uh, just here. God, we thank you for your creative majesty. God, we thank you that every morning we can wake up, that the sun is there, that it speaks to you. God, we thank you that at night the stars come out and they speak to you. God, we thank you that that you speak to all of humanity in this way. God, we thank you that you have also revealed yourself to us in your word, Uh, that you tell us about your character, that even though we know that you are big and mighty, we can also know that you love us and you have a plan for us and you want us to turn to you. God, we thank you that you have given us uh, the Holy Spirit uh, who can check our hearts and can, uh, and can tell us about the sin that is there. God, I pray that uh, this week we would listen to your words, that we would listen to your testimony, and our hearts would be changed. Uh, you are good, you are mighty, and uh, God, I pray that we would love you with our whole hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.